Hi, I'm Dustin Abbott, and I'm here today to give you my 40 megapixel 2024 review of the very, very common and much beloved kit lens, the XF 18 to 55 millimeter. This is an RLMOIS lens. This is a lens, obviously, that has been around for a while at this point, I think somewhere around 11 or 12 years, and thus it has been sold with many, many different cameras along the way and continues to be sold up until this point, though it signs point towards it being replaced in the near future if the rumors are to be believed. Now, this lens has more company than what it used to. It started off as the first of its kind, as kind of a standard zoom, and it was joined by first the Fuji 16 to 55 millimeter, which runs about $1,200. Then much later, we got newer lenses like the Tamron 17 to 70 millimeter f2.8 VC lens. That's an optical stabilizer. And then the Sigma 18 to 50 millimeter f2.8. Now the Sigma runs $549, the Tamron $799, about 800. Now the pure retail for this kit lens is considerably higher than a lot of the competing kit lenses because it is a little bit more premium. And so the full retail pop for it is about 700 US dollars, though it comes for as little as about 400 in kit. Probably very few people have paid the full $700 for it because at this point you're going to get it. You're probably going to get it either in a kit or you're going to get it on the used market where you can get it for considerably cheaper. So the question is, is this lens, is it still holding up at this point? with modern standards and in particular the ultra high resolution that's available on Fuji cameras now. And that's that 40 megapixel um, X-Trans sensor that's found in cameras like my X-H2 here. So we're gonna dive in and see how it holds up to these modern standards. Starting with taking a look at the build here. Now this is a lens that has always felt more premium in terms of its build than what most kit lenses, which tend to be plastic fantastics. That's not the case here. This is built basically just like any of uh, Fuji's other premium type lenses with a very, very few minor exceptions that we'll get to in just a moment. Now, if you don't speak Fuji, let's break down what all of those letters mean in the name of the lens. The R refers to ring or aperture ring. And so it does have an aperture ring, though unlike a lot of other lenses, this doesn't actually have set clicks in terms of the you know designations of where the stops are. And so this is a variable aperture zoom, and so it's much harder to do that. And so what you've got here instead is a lens that, or a ring that will rotate endlessly. It is clicked along the way. There is no declick option. The LM refers to the linear motor, which is the focus system here. More on that in just a moment. The OIS refers to optical image stabilization. And so this makes it of the two kind of standard zooms, the 16 to uh, 55 millimeter and then this lens, this is the one of the two that has an optical stabilizer. Now for a long time, that was a very big deal. A little bit less of a big deal at this point as Fuji has increasingly rolled out in-body image stabilization in their cameras. And so I found in recent comparisons and using non-stabilized versus stabilized a lens like this side by side by side, Frankly, I didn't really notice the difference of the optical stabilizer, but your mileage may vary, obviously, depending on what camera you're using for it. Now, as far as some of the physical features here, of these four different standard zooms that are available at the moment on Fuji X mount, this is the shortest of all of them. It is six millimeters shorter than the Sigma, but it's a whopping 36 millimeters shorter than the 16 to 55 millimeter and even more so of the Tamron 17 to 70 millimeter, which is the longest of the bunch. The dimensions here are 65 millimeters in diameter by 70.4 millimeters in length. That's 2.56 inches by 2.77 inches. Up front, we have a pretty common 58 millimeter front filter thread. The weight here is 310 grams or about 11 ounces. So compared to some of these kit lenses that I've used in the past, the Plastic Fantastics, that's a little bit heavier than most of them, but it's it's only heavy in a very, very relative sense because overall the weight is still uh, nice and light. And I think on most camera bodies, it's going to balance just fine. Obviously on a bigger body like my X-H2, uh, it's no problem at all. Now, unfortunately, it is the only one of these four zoom lenses that has a variable aperture. It goes from f2.8 to f4. And unfortunately, as is pretty common with kit lenses, that aperture closes down fast. And so we actually only have 
uh, f2.8 for a couple of millimeters. By 20 millimeters, it closes to f3.2. By 30 millimeters, it closes to f3.6. By 42 millimeters, we close to f4, where it remains up until 55 millimeters. And so unfortunately, you're going to have a fairly significant light gathering disadvantage relative to the other options on the platform. Something to consider if you want to shoot in low light. Now, Fuji has always offset that a little bit by this having an optical image stabilizer in it. And the image stabilizer, of course, it's not as fantastic as what modern lenses are because the technology obviously has improved over that period of time. But of course, having a stabilizer of some kind is a whole lot better than having no stabilizer of any kind. So even if you're, you know, there are lenses that are better than this in terms of the stabilization. It does get the job done. It's a little bit harder for me to test at this point. I did test it some on the X-T3 back when I did my original review of this lens on the X-H2. I can't, you can't turn off one system independent of the other. So I can't turn off the in-body stabilization and keep the, you know, in-lens stabilization on. So between the two of them, it does a great job. I can't really break down you know, where one begins and the other ends, unfortunately. Now, unlike any of the other three options, this is the only lens to have no weather sealing of any kind, not even a gasket at the lens mount. I would say it also has the poorest manual focus ring implementation of any of these. It's a pretty thin ring here at the front and there's only the tiniest little separation between the zoom ring and the manual focus ring. What you're going to find, particularly if you're using gloves, is it's not hard to grab one rather than the other. And so as far as the implementation, there is some very obvious stepping as you do manual focus. And so it's like you, you move focus in little chunks rather than a nice smooth gliding kind of a, a true manual focus emulation. And so I didn't love manual focus on this lens at this point. It also unfortunately has the lowest magnification of any of these lenses. It will produce a maximum magnification of 0.15 times at 30 centimeters, which is easily bested by some of the others, most notably the Sigma 18 to 50 millimeter, which has a much higher magnification level on it. But beyond that, the build remains nice. I mean, Fuji has not really changed their design kind of ethos all that much over the last decade. And so this lens doesn't necessarily feel dated in terms of the design and the copy that I'm using, a loaner from Fuji Canada, thanks Fuji, uh, it's probably been used a lot of times and it's holding up really well. It doesn't look much different than a retail copy. So kudos to this lens. I do think it is a well-made lens. Now, when it comes to autofocus, this lens on paper would seem to be great. It's got Fuji's linear motors. And so, I mean, that obviously is their more premium focus system. But as I found comparing it to both the 16 to 55 millimeter and then also to either the Tamron 17 to 70 millimeter and then the Sigma 18 to 50 millimeter, this lens shows its age probably the most when it comes to the focus system. It is linear motor technology, yes, but it's not fresh linear motor technology and it's gotten a lot better over the years. So I found in a recent three-way comparison between the Sigma, the 16 to 55 and this lens, for stills I rank this number three out of the group. I found that as you can see here that it had the least focus confidence, kind of some you know double clutching and pulsing there before it finally settles on focus and thus the speed is a little bit closer. I also found that it slowed down more relative to the others in dimmer light situations because remember it has a slower max maximum aperture at almost all focal lengths outside of 18 to 20 millimeters. And so anything beyond that, it's going to have less light gathering potential and slow down a little bit more. And it also I noted when doing my eye test that you'll notice there's a lot of jumping back and forth between the, the eyes. What that tells me is there's just less confidence. It's not locking on to something and just staying glued there unless you tell it to move to the other eye, which you do have the option of doing. But the fact that it's jumping back and forth, as you can see here, shows you that there is less confidence there than what is optimal at this stage. Remember, of course, this focus system was designed long before the idea of AI tracking, uh, eye detect was even even conceived of. And so it stands to reason that newer lenses that are designed with that technology in mind do a little bit better in that regard. Now, when it comes to the video side of things, it's a bit of a mixed bag. 
On the positive side, you can see here that focus pulls are really quite good. You can see that there's no real slowdown. It's a good rapid transition from one focus point to another. Now, when I switched to doing my hand test, I found that the overall pulls are not bad, but it wasn't always as responsive as say the 16 to 55 millimeter in that I would move my hand away and there would be a kind of a pause before it reacted. So not quite as responsive as what I would like. The thing that is uh, unfortunate here is that when you're trying to do static shots, you will see some pulsing, particularly if you have all points active, which is the way that I kind of prefer to shoot most of the time. I also noted when zooming in and out that you can see some visible warping along the side of the frame. That's something that's pretty common, unfortunately, on Fuji. The 16 to 55 millimeter does better than what this lens does. The Sigma and the Tamron, if anything, are worse in that regard, by the way. So overall, autofocus is a bit of a mixed bag for, you know, everyday shots, kind of real world shots. It did pretty good as long as the lighting was decent. Again, I did notice it slowed down some in, in lower light situations. And I did notice sometimes a little less confidence on locking onto an eye than what I would like. Now, finally, let's talk about the image quality. And what I'll do is I'll give you a bit of an overview. And then if you want an optical deep dive on a 40 megapixel sensor, stay tuned for that right after my conclusion in a few minutes. The major disadvantage here relative to the other competitors we've already covered, and that is that there is a variable aperture. And so as you're going throughout the zoom range, you're going to get you know increasingly less light gathering potential. And unfortunately, it's not like stopping a lens down. A lot of times if a lens has a maximum aperture, say of f2.8, you stop it down to f4. By f4, you're typically starting to see some visible improvements to image quality. That's not the case with the variable aperture zoom because you know, f4 on the telephoto end is still wide open. And so it doesn't have any advantage of stopping the aperture down. So, and a few other metrics, when it comes to vignette and distortion, I found that there was some give and take between this and the 16 to 55 millimeter. This has a, a little bit less distortion. There is a little bit of a very mild mustache pattern left behind, but it was only a plus 19 to correct on the wide end. And that's not amazingly good, but it's not bad. And it's better than some of the other options. It, this needed a plus 19. I found with 16 to 55, I needed a plus 22. With the Sigma, I needed an even greater plus 24. So it does well in that metric. Now, it does have a little bit more vignette than what does the 16 to 55 millimeter, though less than the Sigma. I needed to correct for a little over two stops of vignette in the corner, wide open at f2.8. I also found that when it comes to uh, controlling chromatic aberrations, that this lens isn't quite as good as the 16 to 55 millimeter, which is basically the tops of the four lenses, but it is better than what say the Sigma was in my comparative test. And you can see here that there is some fringing mostly after the plane of focus in this close comparison, but far less than the Sigma, for example, as you can see here. Now, when it comes to resolution, it is there that I feel like this lens really shows its age the most. I found in doing a lot of side-by-side -side tests that the six, excuse me, the 18 to 55 millimeter, it showed the least amount of contrast. Images just look less contrasted, they have less pop to them compared to either of the other lenses that I did in this test. And so what I found is that, uh, you just, as you see, for example, side by side here in this shot, you can see that the, there's just kind of like the shadows are almost raised a bit because contrast just isn't as good. And what I found found is that as I went throughout the zoom range on the telephoto end, it is it gets increasingly softer as you kind of go throughout that, that zoom range with some of the best performance at 18 millimeters, some of the worst performance at you know 50 millimeters and beyond. We'll look at that a little bit closer here in just a moment. When it comes to color, that's something that I feel like uh, Fuji's optical glass has always been very good. And of course, Fuji sensors have a nice color as well. I, f I felt like this is still probably the one of the most significant strengths that if you're not pixel peeping, this is still producing really nice looking images, particularly for, you know, uh, travel type photos, you know, more landscape or street type shots. I felt like they looked nice and clean. And I had this on a golf course. I got some really great looking shots where the colors captured are really, really nice from it. That's definitely a strength there. 
When it comes to the bokeh quality, I found that this, the bokeh here is actually a little bit smoother than what is the 16 to 55 millimeter. I like the Sigma a little bit better, but this was had less busyness, a less kind of onion or concentric circles going on in it. But of course, the problem is, is that you're going to produce less bokeh with this lens than any of the other lenses. For one thing, if you're trying to get in close, remember it has the lowest maximum magnification. And of course, on the telephoto end, it has the smallest maximum aperture. So as a byproduct, this is not necessarily always an easy lens to produce a lot of bokeh with. So it's not going to give you that pro look to that people are often looking for where the subject really stands out from the background. It's going to be very rare to be able to create that, that situation. Remember, this is a, a variable aperture kit style lens, and so don't expect too much from it in the bokeh department. So in conclusion, at this stage, I would say the primary reason to consider this lens is if you're getting it in kit and getting a reasonable price on it, or you find a good price on it used, and you really need an optical image stabilizer. If neither one of those things are uh, apply to you, I would say that you're better served at this stage doing one of two things, and that is either buying the Sigma 18 to 50 millimeter, which has a very similar form factor and is lighter still, and has better image quality, better autofocus, basically better performance uh, all throughout. And so, and it's also cheaper if you're just comparing MSRP. The other option is to wait. It is rumored that Fuji will soon be releasing a 16 to 50 millimeter f2.8 to f4.8 WR lens. So I believe it's going to be optically superior. I think the autofocus is going to be better and it's going to have weather sealing. And so obviously we don't know a lot of details about it. It's, it's rumored at this point. But I would say that it's pretty clear that Fuji does have a replacement. This lens is old at this point. And so if you, you want to buy something right now, I would probably go for the 18 to 50 millimeter. This lens has served a lot of people well, and a lot of people have fondness for it. But I think the truth of the matter is, is it's a lens that seemed really high performing when the resolution level was 16 megapixels. It still seemed pretty good when it was 24 megapixels, less good when I first reviewed it at 26 megapixels on the first X trans sensor. And I was like, what's all the hype about? It wasn't as good as what I expected. And here on 40 megapixels, it's just, it's too much for an older lens that was never designed to resolve a sensor with that high of resolution. And so that's why I think a newer option or waiting is probably better for you. I hope this helps you out. You know, if you're looking at buying a lens, maybe on the used market or just coming into Fuji, hopefully this helps you to make a more informed buying decision. And if you look in the description down below, I do have linkage to a text review. There's buying links there. And if you want even more information, stay with me right now and we'll dive into an optical deep, deep dive together. So first of all, taking a quick look at vignette and distortion here on the uh, wide end at 18 millimeters, you can see that there is some obvious barrel distortion and some vignette, though not a crazy amount of vignette. After some manual correction, you can see there's a little bit of that mustache pattern that is left, though it's not too bad. And of course, the correction profile does a better job with it. Now, when it comes to longitudinal chromatic aberrations, we can see in this shot that if we jump in at a high resolution level, you can see that there is just a little bit of fringing, a little bit of kind of bleeding with some fringing around the edge. Not too bad before the plane of focus, but there is some kind of greenish, green-blue fringing after that. As we look towards the bokeh uh, highlights here, just a mild amount of fringing there, but nothing too bad. Likewise, in this shot, as we take a look at some of the bright, shiny areas here, again, fringing is not looking too bad. And as you look at these lights, looking around the edge of them, not too bad. And as we transition towards out of focus, again, very, very mild amounts of fringing, but nothing too serious. So both of those metrics, this lens actually does fairly well in. The big challenge for this lens is it was never designed with such a high resolution sensor in mind. And so if we do my modern test, 40 megapixels and at 200% magnification, you can see here looking at the center of the frame, while there is a decent amount of resolution that's there, you can see that contrast is quite low. Just there's lots of areas where there's kind of a, a little bit of a smear look to the textures. 
mid frame is much the same again a decent amount of resolution but contrast is not great and as we scroll throughout the image we can just see that at no place do the textures really pop corners again not bad again the sharpness profile across the frame is not bad but the contrast just doesn't hold up on this high resolution sensor and if we go over to the other side you can see again just the contrast is not fantastic centering here doesn't look too bad all across the frame now, if we compare this to a modern lens in the Sigma 18 to 50 millimeter, you can see just what that difference looks like. How much more contrast there is for the Sigma, just a lot more pop to all of those textures, a lot more detail. That's look at the text here, just a lot more information there, and that's true here in the mid frame. And if we pop down to the corners, it's the one place where I would say that the Fuji still holds up. It probably beats the corners for the Sigma by just a little bit. Stopping down to f4 does make an improvement as you can see the increasing the contrast here in the center of the frame less of an improvement in areas like the mid frame and down into the corners if anything there seems to be a mild regression in the corner a bit more improvement from f4 to f5.6 and if we look down here in the corners we can see that the corner is a little bit improved though frankly it looked better at f2.8. I would say there is a mild bit more improvement at f8 before diffraction starts to kick in. You can see just a little bit more contrast. By f11, you can see the image really starting to soften once again due to diffraction. And by the time you get to f22, which is minimum aperture here, the image is really, really soft. So if you compare 18 millimeters to 23 millimeters here on the right, we can see that by 23 millimeters, we've got a little bit more contrast and detail there. Maximum aperture has closed f3.2, but there is a little bit of improvement in the image quality. I would say the, the mid frame here has a little bit better contrast as well. Likewise, down in the corners here, because this was good at f2.8 and a little bit worse at others, you can see it probably still has the tiniest bit of an edge at f2.8 relative to the 20. 23 millimeter there at f3.2 stopping down to f4 does give us a bit of a contrast boost in the center of the frame in the mid frame there's also a little bit of a contrast boost and down into the corners again we see an interesting thing there's a bit more contrast but like as we saw wide open the detail in the corners actually regresses a little bit Peak performance once again comes at f8, and you can see that the contrast and the detail is the best at f8. Mid frame is looking nice and crisp here, and down into the corners, you can see the corners are much improved. This is a pretty good performance here on this high resolution sensor, and so I would say that if you want best quality, shooting about f8 and somewhere in the middle of this range from 20 to 30 millimeters is going to give you your best results. Now we can see moving on to 35 millimeters that there's a bit of a regression in the center of the frame. Uh, not so much in contrast, but more in just the basic resolution. And you can see these uh, kind of the text here looks a little bit mushy. Even at F4 stopping down a bit, that's true. We can see that the mid frame doesn't look quite as good. Corners are pretty decent, not too bad, but we can see that overall there's just not as much resolution in general. Once again, stopping down uh, gives you some improvement and most at f8, though even at f8, it's not as sharp as what we saw at 23 millimeters and mid frame is looking pretty good at f8, not quite as good as at 23 millimeters, but again, corners looking pretty good. F8 is definitely the sweet spot for this lens. And so if you're shooting at a high resolution, stopping down to f8 is going to give you the best results. Now, if we move on to the telephoto end of things here, maximum aperture is now f4, even stop down to f5.6. So you can see the center results are really quite soft and the mid frame is soft and the corners now are also soft. We've been able to improve things by stopping down to f8 previously, but you can see now even at f8, there's just not a lot of detail there. The lens is fairly disappointing on the telephoto end on a high resolution body. Let's go to a real world result to kind of illustrate this. So we have got the Sigma on the right, the Fuji on the left, just 100% magnification here. But if you look in the center of the frame, kind of where peak performance should be, you can see how much better contrast the Sigma has relative to the Fuji. As we pan off towards the side of the frame, you can see that even off towards the edge here, the contrast and the detail is much better on the Sigma, whereas the Fuji just gets kind of soft and a little bit of mush there looking over 
on this side of the image, you can see that the contrast remains superior for the Sigma lens. We'll finish off by taking a look at a few real world images. Here's a shot here that shows that when you can get close to your subject, the bokeh is actually pretty decent. You can see in this that the geometry is not too bad and moving towards the background, things are fairly soft. Colors remain nice and rich, definitely a strength here. And flare resistance is not perfect, but it's not bad either. This image stood out as looking really nice, kind of taking advantage of kind of peak performance from this lens at a wider focal length. And you can see that here at 18 millimeters that off throughout most of the image, the detail looks pretty good. The colors are really, really nice. That's definitely a strength. And detail, I think, is acceptably good here with a little bit of softening towards the edge. But overall, it looks fairly good with the lens stopped down. We can see if we look Closer to the telephoto end, this is at about 43 millimeters that even stopped down a fair bit, that the image overall looks good. But you can see that, uh, you know, as we get anywhere off, right off the center, that there is a fair bit of softening towards the edge of the frame. Details are not really highly resolved, a little bit mushy through here. So again, this is a lens that, you know, a high resolution sensor like this is just a little too much to ask of it. So thanks for sticking around to the very end. Thanks as always for watching. Have a great day and let the light in.